Okay, great. Well, let's go ahead and, and get started. Um, I am Marco Urban. I am the acquisitions editor here at Stanford University Press, where I manage our history and Latin American studies lists. And I am so thrilled to have the opportunity to gather in this way today to highlight Ingrid Blainot's wonderful new book, uh, Vendors Capitalism, a Political Economy of Markets in Mexico City. Um, and so the questions that this book poses about the development of capitalism in, in 20th century Mexico and around labor, class, and the urban fabric of DFA are so important. And I think Ingrid's work really represents deep and broad archival research. So I'm very excited to hear more about it today. Uh, I, I was just saying, I remember the first time that Ingrid and I spoke about the book was at LASA in Barcelona, uh, you know, with a view of the ocean, and that now feels like a totally different reality. But uh, Ingrid, it has been such a pleasure working with you, and I'm so glad the book is now out in the world and generating conversations. Uh, so today we're also joined by Robert Weiss. So thank you, Robert, so much for agreeing to be in conversation with Ingrid today. And before I turn it over to Ingrid and Robert, I just want to mention that we will take about an hour for our event today and we'll be leaving a little bit of time for questions at the end. So during uh, the conversation, you can submit questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, and that's what we'll be using for the Q&A, not the chat or the raised hands function. And so yes, before I turn it over to Ingrid and Robert, I will just read some brief introductions. Uh, Ingrid Blena is lecturer in international development at King's College London. She joined KCL in 2013 and completed the PhD in history at Harvard University. Before embarking on historical studies, she trained as an economist at the University of Buenos Aires. Robert Weiss is professor of history at the University of Northern Colorado. He is the author of For Christ and Country, Militant Catholic Youth in Post-Revolutionary Mexico from Oxford and Bakers and Basques, a social history of bread in Mexico from the University of New Mexico Press. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Ingrid and Robert uh, to talk about this wonderful book. Great, good morning. Thank you for being with us. Um, I, uh, Ingrid and I developed a, a few questions to kind of discuss about the process of the book. Um, and uh, so my first question to, well, my first point is also to say this is a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I have been talking to Ingrid about this book, this project for, for a long time at different stages. And it's a real pleasure to be here um, with the actual book and talking about this wonderful, this wonderful project. Um, <clears throat> Ingrid, could you tell us a little bit about how you how did you come across this project? What were you looking for, um, and how how did you find it? Well, first I would say thank you to you for doing this with us, and thank you, Margot, for the introduction and for making this book happen. So um, about the project, to be honest, I started this project long time ago because I was very intrigued by an idea that one of my professors at Harvard, John Womack, had about what was key to understanding 20th century Latin America. His proposition was that there were multiple modes of production in operation at the same time, and that in urban context in particular, this meant that capitalism was expanding while something else was expanding too. And he called it a proprietary mode of production. That is a lot of independent producers and traders operating in a very with a very different logic from the logic of wage workers and capitalists. And not only were these two modes operating uh, at the same time, but they were in connection with one another. So that when we look at, 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 at history of Latin America, what we see is a lot of within class conflicts, the type that as labor historians we used to study between workers and capitalists, but also between proprietary producers and traders, and also conflicts across these modes of production. So you will have capitalists in conflict with proprietary vendors, workers in conflict with vendors, and, and, and that made of a very fascinating social landscape and a very complex set of social dynamics. So I was very intrigued by this, because as Margot mentioned, I was an economist and I was from Argentina. 
So I arrived to history with a notion of how capitalism developed based on development studies, very much grounded in modernization theory, that as capitalism expands, it supersedes other forms and it becomes the dominant mode and everything else is no longer relevant. And I was also a student of political economy. So I had spent a few years reading Smith, Ricardo Marx and thinking about the transition to capitalism in Europe. And that kind of narrative also was what I thought would make most sense. So when Warman proposes this idea, I'm just fascinated immediately, but also very puzzled. I was intrigued. I didn't know if I believed that was the case or not. So I joined, basically I, I started this project thinking, okay, let's see what happens if we look at this from this perspective. So I was working very inductively from a set of ideas and notions that I was curious about. And then everything else happened. Well, I think you have to. And I think that um, for folks who haven't read the book, um, it's a, it's a, it's a study of markets in Mexico City on the one hand, but it also shows all of the political and social forces, all of the different factions that are involved in uh, bringing goods to the market, selling goods, where they're going to sell them, who has the right to sell them. Um, and, um, and it just seems like an intractable problem of how do you reconcile all of these different interests within the market, not to mention, of course, the people who are trying to feed their families by uh, buying this food. So, um, and, and anyone who's, you know, been in a market in Mexico or has dealt with the issues of uh, street vendors and see how intractable the problems are, uh, seemingly intractable at least, the, this book also gives a wonderful view of how the, how government agents are struggling to, um, you know, negotiate between these forces. And so what we see also as we look at markets is we see the state in action and we see the state not only as a group of functionaries but the more you know uh, intangible constant negotiations um, that, that are happening um, and so one of the values of, the, of this of this book was the way that Ingrid is able to put it in this broader context of Mexican history and in this broader context of a much more complicated and nuanced vision of the economy. Um, and so th this is my next question uh, for her was that, you know, we often have vague ideas, or maybe we have very specific ideas that we write down on for proposals, and then we get to Mexico, we get to the archives, and we realize that we really don't know anything, um, and that the archives are a mess, uh, are certainly much more complicated than we thought. So how how close, when you had a vision of this project, how does, does, does anything resemble um, that original vision in the, in the final project? More or less. <laughs> I went through three iterations, really. I wanted to study the 1950s and 60s. That was the period that fascinated me the most. And that's the period I end the book with. But the, what I found in Mexico, Mexico City, was that the sources were missing. The long tenure of Uruchurto as regente of, of Mexico City, from 52 to 66, it, the, the sources are not all there. There's a, there are some stories about what happened to, to, to that material. So at the time I went back to, to talk to my professors and I remember a conversation with Professor Cotsworth where he said, well, why don't you do three snapshots? Why don't you do three months of transformation of markets? So if you don't have enough on the fifties and sixties for a whole project, why don't you do like a travel guide of history, postcards from the Porfiriato, from the, the 50s and 60s, and then from the 1980s, when you start reorganization of these spaces, there will be the building of the Central de Abasto, the movement of the wholesalers out of the city. So I went back and did all sort of research about these three moments. But the more and more I read the sources, the more and more I got fascinated by what was there before the Porfiriato and what was there in between the Porfiriato and the markets that were built under Uruchurto's tenure. And so I got too fascinated with the 1860s and 70s and too fascinated by the 20s, 30s and 40s 
to, to, to make room for everything. So I ended up writing about the, the period I wrote about between the 1860s and the 1960s um, because uh, I got carried away <laughs> with the in-between chapters. Well, that brings up another issue um, is that um, there's a chronology to the market, to the history of the market that doesn't necessarily coincide with the chronology of the political history. And so you often talk about um, uh, the, the vendors, for example, taking on revolutionary rhetoric that the actual revolutionaries who are in power aren't quite willing or hadn't really thought, <laughs> thought through how the revolution could or should change markets. Uh, how does this kind of make you rethink or rework conventional chronology in Mexican history? Well, so to me, because I was looking at this from a development of capitalism perspective, it made the most sense. The chronology for me was kind of obvious. You, you At the end of the 19th century, you have an expansion of, of, of global markets. You have an, a development of, of infrastructure in Mexico. You had a whole new set of economic opportunities within Mexico for international capital, but also for Mexicans. And that was clearly a, a, a demarcation. And then uh, the next one was the post Great Depression and the states gets more and more involved with promoting businesses in Mexico. So to me, the, the, the periodization I was not learning the periodization from the history books, but more for, from thinking about a, an economic history perspective. So then I, I was interested to see what, for example, uh, 1910 change for markets. The answer is not very much. And as you said, in the 20s, you have a revolutionary government in place, but they haven't had time to figure out what needed to change about markets. So markets are actually very chaotic at that time, where the markets of the Porfiriato are, are already overwhelmed. And the boundaries between street and markets that the Porfirian project had tried to enact uh, are in, in this array because there's too many people and there's no way of managing the relations that are taking place in the markets and the streets. And there's no separation anymore between markets and streets. So. <clears throat> right, right. I mean, and that just brings up, I mean, there's so many ideas in this book about, about space and place. Are you in the shade? Are you in the sun? Are you inside the market? Are you on the edge of the market? How much do you pay? Um, and all of these forces are, you know, usually in conflict with each other. Um, and it's an opportunity, it's an opportunity for um, the uh, well in the in the twenties and the thirties for the new regime to become a state uh, mm -hmm. by inserting itself. Um, I mean, on the one hand, we have the market vendors are turning to state, uh, you know, government officials. At the same time, though, it seems like that these officials are turning to are looking for problems to make themselves useful to therefore build a machinery, make themselves indispensable actors um, when maybe things could have been resolved, you know, without their intervention, perhaps. Um, and, and I think I really liked, um, I think one of, the, one of a possible thesis statements for the book is that when you say uh, that the mutual dependency between the different actors in the market and the state actors was lopsided, um, and this lopsided sense of mutual dependency shaped the local political eco economy. Could you talk about that, the lopsided part, and then also how this dependency helped shape the, the, the political economy? Yes, so I, I think it, it, to probably we need to think of this, the actors that play a role in markets. So you have the vendors, but vendors differentiate at different times, at long different lines. So all of the insiders, outsiders dynamics that appear are part of the process of differentiation of vendors. Because one of the key characteristics of proprietary traders 
and, and, and proprietary producers, but in particular market vendors, is that they're in competition with one another. In that sense, they're very different from a wage worker that work in a factory with decisions made by the overseer, by, by the capitalist. So vendors are buying from, from capitalist merchants. These people who are their suppliers are also their creditors. So there's antagonisms around the prices vendors pay for the products that they bring to the market and the, the interest rates they pay for the loans they're taking from their suppliers. They're also directly facing consumers and the, the, the prices they charge will affect the, 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 the real wages or the real incomes of their consumers. Because if they charge more, they will be more uh, pressed for money at the end of the month to support their families. So is, the, is this relationship between the competition, the relationship with the suppliers, the creditors, and the relationship with the consumers, that you can start to see that there's different power relations going on. And how that power shifts and, and, and that type of actor organizes or, or, or approaches different avenues of collective action to, to protect themselves, to, 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 to be able to embark on a personal project of, of, of progress, of bringing some stability to their economic lives. And as they do that, yes, I think that's what I was trying to do in the book, to show how it's the vendors themselves trying to negotiate their relationship with their suppliers and creditors trying to manage the competition on themselves is that forces them to organize. So they organize not in part to, to, to make a petition to the state collectively, especially after from the late uh, Porfiriato where the state is busy with other stuff and is not paying too much attention anymore to, to, to these actors. And there is the ayuntamiento that's no longer there. So the natural arbiter of the social relations taking place in, 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 in these markets is gone. So who are they? appealing to. And when they realize they can't appeal to this paternalistic uh, ayuntamiento figure anymore, they start trying with the governor, they start trying with the president, but it doesn't work. It, it just not, there's not a, a system, a process or a set of institutions that will allow them to, to make some security for themselves in their economic life. So they start acting collectively and they do all sorts of things. They will create unions from the late years of the revolution into the 20s. They will go on demonstrations. They will obviously relate to the, to the city government and they will do that ever more or in a more organized way as, as the years go by. Now, the relationships are always lopsided and the, and the power balance is shifting. It, 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 it shifts. We can't expect so we can't expect any of those relationships to be constant or stable. So it's a it, it, it's the balance of forces between the different actors at every particular time that shape what happens in these markets and in the institutions of the state that will govern these markets that are very central to the whole way of functioning of, of, of the city. I mean, and also especially um, in these times. Uh, like in the 20s and the 30s, when there the political politicization makes things so hot that the government is terrified that if it doesn't somehow bring in this other uh, malcontent group, that they're going to go to the opposition. And so you see the um, the the tentacles of the pulpo of the pre growing and extending and they don't have eight tentacles they have a hundred tentacles um they're just so terrified that the street vendors are going to join the fascists or or the reactionaries um and so there is you you start to wonder if if there is kind of any ideological principles that are guiding this um because they're trying to incorporate everybody that they possibly can, instead of just saying, make it, taking a firm position and saying the rest of you, you know, deal with it. Yes, and way before the pre, in, in, in 1928, 1929, when they finally suppressed the city council for good in Mexico City, and they created the Consejo Consultivo, they already have to have a representative of small scale vendors, that is, this is already a group that is organized and vocal. And as I said, it was going on demonstrations, it was protesting collectively, it was forming unions. 
It was associating the unions to labor federations. It was a whole process of mobilization from the bottom up that to me forces government actors to react to figure out what is going on and how can they deal with this. And yes, I, as they deal with this, they become more powerful and there is all that process that the historiography records so well. But um, what I was interested is in seeing how the very demands of vendors for conflict resolution, for suppression of competition, for infrastructure, for a modernization that includes them. Because all the sources, so yes, you can be cynical and say vendors are saying that because that's the way to be heard. But actually, they were saying it in, in the 1910s and they were not getting heard. Yeah. So it, it, it's a demand that they had. And I think that's what I was trying to do with the Porfiriato chapter to show how the process of modernization also involves vendors. Some vendors see this as a way of suppressing other vendors and getting the upper hand in the competition with, with them. So they join these markets, they embrace the rhetoric of modernization and cleanliness and hygiene and order because they also want to participate in that project. And they, and they need it because if they have to compete every day for spots, it gets very messy and it can get violent and it can be disruptive. So it's not in the vendor, in, 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 in the most successful vendor's interest to allow that to happen. And it's not in the interest of, of the local government to allow that to happen because markets are so strategic for the smooth functioning of the city. Yeah. Um, and and it, it also gives us another vision um, into democracy is not the, is not the right word, but certainly popular political participation. Um, if we if we try and judge or assess the power of the state um, by elections alone, um, then we could get a very distorted vision of what politics actually means um, in, in Mexico. Uh, what we see in your book and around the markets is incredibly robust political participation and now it does not go through voting ballots at all but um could you talk about kind of how um all of this negotiation and even the apparently the the weakest folks who are able to build collective action how might that make us rethink the trajectory of of democracy and political participation in Mexico. Yes, I don't know if, if we should talk about democracy. I think that would necessitate a discussion of what democracy means, what type of interactions, what type of institutions. But in terms of, of, of the popular politics that I talk about in the book, in the terms of the political actions by vendors, as we were saying, they, 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 they sign petitions collectively, they go on demonstration, they form unions, and by the 20s, the government knows they have to do something about these groups. And that they know very well that they're in relation with other groups and it's the tensions between this type of group that can jeopardize governability in the city. So when they create the Consejo Consultivo in early 1929, they will have to have a representative of big commerce, a representative of small commerce, a representative of big industries, a representative of small industry, of tenants, of, of housewives, of government employees, so they're trying to see all of these groups that are highly mobilized. And that, I think, as you were suggesting, they are ahead of the government in terms of mobilization and, and collective action, in a sense. And they're placing the demands. Well, the government struggles very much with vendors. And if you look at, at the chapter on the 30s, what I claim there, I say, is that the fact that there's so much competition between these vendors that are increasingly mobilized that jeopardize any type of urban project. The Abelardo Rodriguez market, for example, this beautiful, it's described as a microcosm of revolutionary form and, and it's beautiful and there's social services and there's murals and it's gorgeous. Now, what I find in the sources is that it doesn't work. It doesn't work because vendors are competing with one another and if any group comes and stays outside of the market, it will, keep, it will force people to reassess their priorities and, and their decisions and move out because that's where the clientele is. And in the sources, what I find is that the head of market of the late 30s, who happens to be Cardenas' brother, is using it as a jail. 
And, and, and there is an, a, an acknowledgement that this is the practice. Well, it's just temporary. It's until we, we send them to the right authorities. But this market is used by the most important federation of vendors at the time for his, their offices as this jail. No, so it's a market that is beautiful and, and, and promises progress and modernity and inclusion in some sense, but it's not working. And what I claim is not working is because the government does not have the mechanisms to manage the competition between vendors that because of the atomistic nature of proprietary trading cannot be resolved. Mm -hmm. So the, the government learns to deal with these social actors in the city by trial and error so that by the early 40s, they figure out that they have to find, finally fund a bank for small scale vendors so and avoid paying crazy rates to the, their suppliers and creditors. So that, that is something that the vendors, organized vendors have been asking for since the 20s. And it takes all of these negotiations and all of this trial and error for the government to say, okay, we need that. And of course, it will be a tool of political manipulation. Some organizations will be punished, some organizations will be created and promoted for political reasons. But it's only then that we can figure out what happens in, in 46 when the pre is created by the creation of the CNOP that includes vendor. And it's not, it, it's the product of all of these negotiations and all of these attempts at managing this mobilized vendor movement that is very, very fragmentary because of the nature of the social relations that vendors are involved in and the conflict that they are involved in, that it takes some sorting, but the government will be very successful for a while in managing these social spaces. I don't know if that answered your question. No, no, absolutely. Do, do you think that the fact that most of what the market sell is food, uh, is staple items uh, for, for, for food, um does the fact that it's food shape the market and the political dynamics uh that spring from them um or is that irrelevant oh i think it's essential goods what economists can call wage goods because the, the centrality of markets grows and, and mutates to some extent as the city industrializes. Because once you, you have an industrial city, you will have vendors in between capitalists and workers because the, 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 the purchasing power of people's wages will depend on the prices at which they buy stuff in the market. So whether it's, so yes, food, and, and there's a lot of old reasons in, in the history of our colonial markets and why markets were so important and why you had to assess qualities and quantities and weights. And so the, the food is central, but it's because it's something that people need every day to support their families. Mm -hmm. So anything that is o o o of central importance to households and can be considered a wage good will become what defines the, the, the nature of these markets in this period. When you go to markets in Mexico, what do you what do you like to look at? What do you like to see? What do you like to buy? Anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like eating and I like fruit. So, but um, I spent I did spend quite a bit of time in La Marcel, quite a bit of time uh, hanging out with some vendor leaders, but just eating and talking to whoever would take the time to talk to me. Um, I just shopping there. I like shopping there because I like food. Did you, did ever did you ever encounter something in a market that that just surprised you, or or that you found? There were, I, I encounter uncomfortable moments, but I don't think uh, uh, it's fair to talk about it. Um, we can we can talk another time about it. <laughs> In the conference when Margot and I make it to Lhasa again and get to chat. But um, I was surprised at the, at the resilience of vendors and also how many of the people I talked to were many generations of vendors. Mm -hmm. So one of my first contacts in a market was through a graduate student at Harvard who had a friend who 
was another graduate student somewhere else and said, oh, he was the son and the grandchild of a market vendor and they had a sofa de tor de, de Porsche, caldo de Porsche uh, stall and they, the mother and the grandmother are still there and they were single mothers and they were strong women. So, and, and when I did quite a bit of interviews with vendors, that was a pattern I found. And somehow they managed to, 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 to pass on the stores, even if it's not allowed because of the Reglamento de Mercados of the 1950s, 1951, 52, I forget, which is still the Reglamento de Mercados today, by the way. Um, they still do it and find ways. And oh, oh, the first partner of a vendor went after they split up and the new partners in another store. And yeah. th there's, there's a whole community around these markets. It's, it's a living, beating thing. I mean, especially because I imagine um, for a lot of these families, um, a particular stall site is, is patrimony, is family's patrimony that they have earned precisely through decades of political struggle and marching and being in the sun and being in the rain that no reg there's no reglementation that gives them uh that establishes that as family patrimony but that's how they right perceive it and i think you must have seen some of that in the sources you use for your first book too that is precisely the language that vendors use yeah this is a patrimony we don't want to lose it and i've seen that language used from the uh, from from the 30s onwards even when you look at the conflicts around the changes that are happening now in the city, they still, vendors can talk about stores as their patrimony, even if it's not their patrimony. Yes. It, right. it, it, there's no legal grounds for calling it a patrimony. Yes. Um, but uh, it's, um, yes, it, it's, it's a space where there's much more going on than what I talk about in the book because I was being very analytical and I was trying to talk about the social relations of production and how people organize around those and how, what, how conflicts lead to organization and conflict yeah. that leads to organization also leads to government reaction and, 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 and state formation at the same time and how these intertwine industrialization of the city, centrality of markets for uh, providing wage goods, supplying wage goods to, to the population and the government that is supporting the expansion of capitalism by all possible means, uh, give us the, the type of mo economic model or developmental trajectory that Mexico had in the years that I studied. Um, an another really attractive aspect of this book um, is that it, it is um, kind of bringing back social history and bringing it back with economic history, especially at a time when um, people who consider themselves economic historians tend to work in uh, in, depart in, in, in economics departments rather than uh, history departments um, and tend to be kind of very much statistical and, 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 and data driven. You're able to discuss economic history rooted in social history and also manage to write a really compelling um, uh, really compelling narrative. Um, so I think that this is a really nice uh, step and hopefully a, a sign of what's to come uh, in, in economic history. Um, but there's not a lot of models for this. Um, what, how, how did you feel about it? You were looking for models to do economic history kind of rooted in a narrative and, and this kind of approach. No, I wasn't looking for models. Partly because I was interested in historical transformation. And that is something that is very hard to do with panel data, with data. It's very hard to do within economics to, to really think about structural change because there's a lot of things going on and it's, a lot of that is endogenous and the nature of the data will change and that becomes complicated. But no, I was working very inductively. As I said, I was intrigued by an idea I was very young, oh no, I was younger, and I thought I had all the time in the world, so why not pursue it? So I was not trying to find models to, to, to work from. 
I was just getting inspiration from different books and different authors and trying to be true to the sources and, and, and try to read the sources lots of times until the story weaves in my mind so I can say, okay, this is what I think is a good reading of this material. Yeah, yeah. As you were going through that material, did you ever um, come across a kind of historical puzzle or a problem um, that you couldn't elude, that you just had to kind of work through? Um, something that perhaps like a puzzle piece that just wouldn't fit and then you realized you know, you had to find a, a different way to resolve the question. I, I, I don't think so. That, that's why, so I want, I would have wanted to have more about the, I would have loved to see the, the books, no, of the vendors, what they were paying, what they were borrowing at, uh, but I didn't have those sources. So I was, I don't think I left out anything because I couldn't fit it in. So I, I, I read it with an open mind and I, I read the sources time and time again, and they're very coherent. Hmm. So I, I think I could write the book with all those sources for all those years because the sources repeat themselves. Yeah. They get more boring as you go further in time because there's less, the language is less rich and there's more formulaic and there's more like a bureaucratic tramite. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I, I was just excited to, to see the story formed by the reading of the sources. Well, it's pretty, it's pretty remarkable. Um, the, the awareness that um, this this shouldn't surprise us, but the, uh, how aware the um, different vendors are of the kind of language they need to be adopting, um, the, the 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 lucidity of their analysis of their situation, oftentimes it's just us as historians being quiet and listening, um, and and it just shows how um, I mean kind of getting back to this this puesto is mine and because of my family because i've been working we've been working so hard for generations to defend it um a good portion of what it means to be a market vendor is to engage in these political negotiations the part about sell, buying and selling food is fundamental also but that's only you know a part of it yes and you must have seen the same thing in in, in bakers and bass so you must have seen the same type of sources so, but by the way, when I read your book, I realized I was on the right track because you had the same type of conflict. You yeah. have the conflict between the bakery owners who are capitalists and the workers and how they start negotiating once you have labor boards and they have to figure out contracts, but also how those same capitalists are exploiting proprietary producers of bread and, 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 and peddlers of bread and how the workers are pitted against those vendors of bread and those producers of bread because they get a better deal in their contract if the other guys get to go away yeah so it, it, that's the type of that's the type of material i i wanted to 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 work with but i forgot the question i'm sorry i got <laughs> I, I, I started thinking about your book and then i forgot where uh, were we at I I uh, I don't remember either. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. How, 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 next time we see each other at the conference. No, no. How the work of being a market vendor, um, at least yeah. two thirds yeah. of their time, is dedicated to political negotiations. Well, but look, I think that that's just historians not being vendors. So if you're a vendor, you know what your problems are. Yeah. You know that you're paying too much. You know that you're paying crazy interest rates. You know that when newcomers, either migrants or young people who are peddling on the streets or, or people from another area that were displaced because of gentrification or some kind of urban conflict come to your street or outside of your market, you know that those are your conflicts. Yeah. And to me, what the one bit that 
it's not that it surprised me because I was on that track to begin with, but that surprises me how little it features in the literature is those conflicts between vendors themselves. No, we tend to think about the conflicts between the supermarket and the vendors or the gentrification project and the vendor or the government official that's oppressing and, and, and getting bribes and doing horrible things to vendors. But we are never thinking along the lines that vendors are thinking. And when you read the sources, it's every other source will speak about competition and violent clashes among vendors themselves and their organizations as they develop their organizations. So I think vendors know very well how hard they work to do the jobs they do. They're not doing jobs for a wage, so they cannot go and negotiate with a capitalist or go on strike against the capitalist. So the forms of furthering their interests and trying to, to, to have some kind of material progress, if that's possible, uh, is they are aware and they are asking and they know and they articulate it and they relate their needs and their issues with what's going on. And sometimes they are ahead, as you said, they are ahead of, of, of the government. It seems very analogous to, um, to agrarian conflicts uh, in villages and between villages. And when for generations people were thinking about campesinos versus hacendados and when you talk to campesinos then their problem is campesinos from the other <laughs> from the village next door um i wanted to, in the last couple minutes we had i wanted to talk a little bit about if you could walk us through the market uh mm -hmm. you could walk us through this picture and kind of what, what what would you point out to us in this photo that you think is important? It's a beautiful well, photo. I love the photo. I love the photo. And I think we talked about several things already that I see in this photo. But I wanted a photo that was about the period I wrote about. There were some beautiful contemporary pictures that reflected the markets as I found them when I first visited them or when I did my research. But this picture to me is it, it, what I wanted to write about because it's neither a Porfirian market nor one of the ones built under Uluturtu, but something in between. And it looks a bit like a Porfirian market, and, uh, but, it's, it, but it, it's also already, well, it's a picture from the 60s and, the, and, and it, it, it's already part of this economic boom of the post-1930 era. So I was happy to have a photo that's so stunning but also that um, shows how random things are in history. And this is a market that was built in 1934 and there was no other market like this at the time. So it's, it's this unique market and, and, and the history of it, which is so fascinating that I, I wanted to have in the cover. What is the date of this photo? Have... It's in a sobre without uh, actual, yeah, 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 I also have it here. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't have a date. It I'm just it doesn't have a date. It's, it, it's in, a, it's in a Hermanos Macho collection, but it's, it says between 1950 and 1970. Okay. So it, they don't have precise dates in, in those uh, collections. Yeah. But I like it. You have a, a vendor with a child working alongside them. You have mm -hmm. the customers. You, you have light. You have, I don't know. Yeah, the kind of beautiful windows up here on the top. Yeah. Um, the vendor with his uh, campesino hat. Mm. Um, the the teenage, you're the young woman who doesn't look super happy to be doing her errands. Um, it's like great, it. great. It, and it's perfect here that we have this nice black part for the title to stand <laughs> there as well. Yeah. If I might just jump in, um, you know, at the end of the book, Ingrid, you talk a little bit about today in Mexico City and the kind of questions around gentrification and the future of La Merced. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what the status is of public markets in Mexico City today? They are in poor shape. So, uh... We won't talk about this because we will stay too late. But part of what I was trying to do in the book is talk about a time where the state felt responsible for the building and managing and uh, 
taking care of these spaces. Since the 70s, there hasn't been much interest in market halls because there were so many street vendors that politically it was more vital to, 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 to find ways of incorporating the, the, the street vendors that were much more numerous. So there's been a lot a lack of investment. And the, remember that we look at that beautiful picture that we could have used for the cover and all the electric cables start dangling and this. So the burn, the burn down and, and La Merced had several fires and that made the government of the city to try to put forward a project for the improvement of that area that would have involved tearing down some buildings and would have involved changing the way things work in the market. And that's what vendors are still fighting against. And, and they, they, they have web pages and they have cultural activities designed to showcase the history of these neighborhoods and how much they are part of the city and they don't want to be displaced because if you create some kind of culinary center to showcase Mexican state foods and, 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 and it's gorgeous that food, but their understanding is that that would displace them. It would increase property values. It would displace uh, residents. It wouldn't allow them to have spaces to keep their staff because a lot of them will have rental space in local properties. And so it's very much an open story because it's still in happening and they're still fighting and they're still trying to save their spaces. But in a context where governments do their bit because they need to manage the city, but now supermarkets obviously are everywhere and there's other form of, of, of street commerce, organized street commerce, Mercado Sobre Ruedas, Tianguis, that can replace this type of space that demands a lot of investment in terms of infrastructure and upkeep from government. So now there's cheaper ways of supplying the city for the government and, and there are not enough of these markets in comparison to other, other possible outlets. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, well, Robert, I don't know if you had any other questions and I would love to invite questions from the audience as well. Um, I, Robert, did you have anything else? Although I, I did have one that occurred to me as as you were talking, Ingrid, you kind of alluded to this gap in the record in terms of the, the 50s and 60s and how it seems like there may have been some kind of motivated reason why, why there are these missing records. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on why you think that might be or some of the theories around that. Well, the, the, in the city archive, the, the material, when I did research for this, the materials past the revolution were not properly cataloged or organized. It, and the, but that's, uh, so I did open some boxes and I saw some materials and it was very productive and, and exciting. But the, the, part, the other part of the story is that the regente Uruchurtu who was there from 52 to 66 took home a lot of the archives. And another researcher went in to the family property they, she was allowed to see the, 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 the collection of materials, but they were gone. And the story is that he asked his nephew to burn these materials before he died. And that same nephew also told me that story when I met with him lots of years ago now in Mexico City. So the idea is that there was someone who was in charge of, this, of the city government who was very successful at what he did. It's, 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 we, there hasn't been any other person in, in charge of the city for so long, but uh, he burned the archive himself, or at least some of it. So you could access it through the presidential archives or the secret services archives that have things to do and say about the markets, but the, 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 the type of archive that I wanted to see about the everyday working and managing of these spaces uh, was not there. <laughs> so it's, it's hard when that happens and it's, discouraging, but that's why I ended up researching all sort of different time periods, which was fun too. Um, well, I think that, I mean, one, one reason people should read this book, um, 
if we look, it, it, it's not a thick, it's not a thick volume. And so what he managed, what she manages to do, though, is to bring into a coherent narrative hundreds, hundreds of often short, um, you know, telegrams that are three lines, letters that are two pages, that are, um, especially when you're trying to figure out what the hell is going on, are so complicated, so confusing, uh, often very boring, once in a while very exciting. And she manages to bring these all together in a cohesive, compelling narrative um, that at the same time shows the complexities. And I think that she kind of joins the wonderful work um, that our friends like Suzy Porter, Sandra Mendiola, Cristina Jimenez have done about this kind of ground level uh, vida cotidiana, showing it the ways of everyday life in, in very complex uh, and very broad contexts. Um, and she manages to get it in under 200 pages, which is an amazing feat. Well, I, as an editor, would also say, you know, it would make a great addition to a syllabus. <laughs> <laughs> it is um, a short book. But so we, we do actually, we have a question from Susie Porter, who is asking what kinds of topics for future research did writing the book lead to for you, Ingrid? So, I am not doing research in history at the moment because life has got complicated. So I am now going back to more theoretical work on political economy. So what I'm trying to work on now, well, it's two things. And, and hi, Susie, it's really nice to, to hear from you. And thank you for, for your message. Um, I'm trying to work on two things. One is very contemporary, which is care work and domestic work across the income distribution in Mexico City and Buenos Aires. I have a project to do tons of interviews with households to, to track how people organize their, their lives around their need to take care of their families and to take care of their homes. So that's one thing. But the other one is uh, to to try to go back to political economy and the key categories of political economy to understand better historical transformations. So it is pursuing further the topic about uh, the development of capitalism from a theoretical and or empirical perspective, but not necessarily working with Mexican archives, because I don't know when, if I will be able to do that again. We have a few more questions um, from Viridiana Hernandez, and I'll, I'll just go ahead and read them because I think they're, they're phrased very well. Um, so when La Merced was built, was it seen as a sign of modernity for street vendors as it was for the bureaucratic elite? Before La Merced, vendors identify themselves as a group, street vendors identity, and if so, how did La Merced impact that identity? Second question out of curiosity, in the present street vendors diversify their portfolio? Do they sell in La Merced or in Tanguis, Sobre Ruedas, and in Mercados de Colonia? Okay, that was too many questions for me. It was. To I, think, but, Ingrid, um, I think you can probably see the question through the, the Q&A function if you want to drill down into it, but yes, great. Project. Yes, I, maybe I can see them. Yes. <laughs> um, so I think that the sources allow us to see read past the government's propaganda to think that a lot of vendors did see La Merced as a form of modernization and an avenue for progress. In the sources, I think it is, it is acceptable to read that there were a lot of vendors who were forced into the market, but there were also a lot of vendors who saw this as, as something that they but they deserve to be part of the modern city, to be, to be able to afford something that looked like a middle-class way of life. There were social services, there were idea that they were going to ask for credits to build their own homes as part of these incorporated groups. Um, now the relationship with street vendors, the, what, what, I, uh, what I find in the sources and I think I wrote in the book is that the relationship changes over time. 
So in the 1860s and 70s, and to some extent in the 1880s, there's no so much of a differentiation between streets and markets. Markets happen wherever the government officials allow them, al viento or in halls, and there's very few halls. So it happens in, 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 a, in a variety of spaces. And it's with the modernization project of the Porfirian elite that there is the differentiation. So some vendors will become locatarios and will embrace this identity to, in part, suppress their competitors among those who are left behind. Because every time we see this formality, informality divides or, or, or modern and, uh, and traditional, what we're seeing is groups trying to, to get ahead. And they get ahead in case of vendors because of the nature of their economic relations by, by fighting against others very much like them. So at the time of the building of La Merced and the other markets that the government of the city built under Uruchurtu, we, we, have, we are coming from a period of population growth and city growth where there wasn't so much infrastructure. So there had been moments like the building of the Abelardo Rodriguez and other attempts, including private markets. In the, in the post-revolutionary period, the government didn't know really well how to manage markets and they tried to have contracts with private contractors to build markets, but it didn't work for the same reasons that the Abelardo Rodriguez didn't work, because the conflicts between groups of vendors in different streets or in different places or in halls in La Lagunilla, La Lagunilla is one where there's tons of conflict because they negotiate the police suppressing the competitors, but then the police can't suppress the competitors because there's always more competitors coming. So they're saying, we're going to leave the market. And, and that type of thing, I think uh, by the time uh, La Merced opens in 1957, there's groups that are ready to, to, to use this relationship with the state to, to differentiate from others who very much like them, but who don't get a place and therefore are suppressed. And at the end of the book, I, I, I try to sh showcase some sources from the, the, the intelligence services where basically vendor leaders that by now are operating very closely with the government are, are, are suppressing people within even their organizations. So basically they're, they're trying to, to manage conflict and to manage competition by ways of the carrot and the stick. So it's, it's that complicated relationship that I was interested in exploring as part of a much broader period of developmentalism and state capitalism, where obviously is the interest of the construction companies and, and the bus drivers and et cetera, et cetera, that are playing a part in the shaping of these urban spaces. I don't know what else it was there. Uh, let, me, let me go back. <laughs> Well, so we're actually approaching the, the end of our time and we've had a couple of other great questions come in about the informal economy and capitalism and democracy. And so I, my hope is actually that we can perhaps uh, do a follow-up blog post to address some of these, these other questions. Um, but this has been such a wonderful discussion. So thank you so much to Ingrid for sharing this work with us and to Robert for joining. Uh, I will of course mention if you haven't already ordered the book, you can do so through, do so through the Stanford Press website. And I believe, oh, as you see, we have a discount code. Um, but yes, thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. Also thanks to my colleagues at Stanford, Kendra Shiner and Stephanie Adams for their work behind the scenes to set this up. Um, and yes, thank you so much all to, for, for gathering today to celebrate this wonderful book. And you know, fingers crossed that we see you in San Francisco for LASA next year. Uh, and congratulations again to you, Ingrid. This has been a, a wonderful discussion. Uh, thank you, Margot, and thank you, Robert. And also for the questions.